Clayson, and Kevin is the co-founder and vice president of Prosperity for a revolutionary multi-million dollar real estate investment company, which is stronger, by the way, in case you can't figure that out. He is a published author and has been featured in a series of entrepreneurial books called Entrepreneur on Fire, alongside such notable contributors as New York Times best-selling author Tim Ferriss of the 4-Hour Workweek, Week and author, real estate mogul, and celebrity entrepreneur Barbara Corcoran from the hit ABC show Shark Tank. He is a nationally acclaimed MC and motivational speaker who travels the country motivating, inspiring, and assisting up and coming business owners to create winning and profitable businesses. If you ask him how he would describe himself, he would likely say he's just a husband and father who is a shoe salesman at heart. <laughs> but for those of us who know him, he is affectionately known as the Chief Officer of Awesome. Please yep. welcome him. It's like deja vu, here I am again. By the way, I'm really glad that we had a chance to clap, because I felt like the State of the Union address was going on in the other room. It was like every few seconds they were clapping over there. Oh my gosh. But uh, hey guys, thank you so much for being here tonight. I'm excited to be with you and uh, to be able to share some things with you. But I'm going to just pause for a moment, because I have prepared a keynote for you, but I don't know if I'm going to give it. Here's the reason why. Would it be more beneficial for you to hear some of what I would like to share with you, which is really helping you understand what's even more American than, than you know, pie a la mode. What's <laughs> really at the root of this country and how in many ways we can transform it back to what I think it used to be with a set of principles and share some things with you. Or would it be more helpful to have Steve Earl come back up and have the two of us answer more questions, go into a little bit more depth on some of the topics that we covered tonight. I'm going to leave it up to you. What would you prefer? Keynote. <laughs> okay. I'm Steve. So, that's great. So, here's the deal. I need to take you on a journey with me. Okay, I was 13 years old. Everybody say 13. 13. By raising your hands, how many of you have been 13 years old before? Okay, good. I want to make sure we're all in the same place. And, uh, and I, I was, I was, it was shortly after my 13th birthday, and my parents and I, we were going to go celebrate my 13th birthday with the most incredible birthday party known to man. Now, I grew up in a place called California. Raise your hand if you've heard of California. Good, okay, some of you have not. It's a state, uh, and I can give you some more info on it. Uh, I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. And uh, so we were going to go river rafting for my 13th birthday. And it was just going to be my mom, my dad, and four 13-year-old boys on a self-guided river rafting trip to California. Wow. What could go wrong, right? Your parents what could, loved what, you. What could go wrong? Come on. And, uh, and so I was so excited. I thought this has got to be the most incredible birthday party known to man. Now my dad, when he was younger, he had worked on the river for a lot of years. And so he thought, look, this is going to be no problem. It was the Stanislaus River. Ever, anybody ever been to the Stanislaus River? Okay, so you're familiar with it. So the Stanislaus River, that's where we were going to go. It's not a real crazy river. And so that's why you could do a self-guided river rafting tour. Now, before we went and got in the raft, on our, we had to go pick up my friends that were going to be the co-captains of our little journey here. And so the first house we go to is my friend Tony. Tony had been a friend of mine for a lot of years. And Tony gave me what was one of the coolest birthday presents I'd ever got. Does anybody here remember Super Soaker 50? Yes. Yes. It was like, come on, it was the most incredible squirt gun known to man, right? Look at that little beep, beep, beep. This was like, you pump it up and you could literally puncture a hole in someone's abdomen with this thing. It was fantastic. So I got a Super Soaker 50, and I got to tell you, by the way, that was a really exciting gift for me because I grew up in a household where we did not have a lot of money. My dad was a great man, but he would go from job to job to job, from sales position to sales position. There was no retirement that was being built. There was no incredible amount of income. There was no investing that was happening. There was just trying to make it day to day. That's what was taking place. And so to get a Super Soaker 50, I think at that time, those water guns were like 25 bucks. That was not a gift that I would have got. I thought it was incredible. So all, right away, I'm going, I'm going river rafting. I have a Super Soaker 50, probably the best day ever, right? 
But it gets better. I go to my next friend's house. This is a guy by the name of Sean. And Sean knew that I had a passion for music. And he gave me a cassette tape. Raise your hand if you're under the age of 30. Anybody here under the age of 30? Okay, a few of you. For those of you that are under the age of 30, a cassette tape is like the grandparent of the MP3. Okay? Is it, it was a lip, you put it in a machine and it played music. That's what it was. And I got this cassette tape. And I was so excited because it was crisscross. Does anybody know who crisscross is? Crisscross will make you jump, jump, jump. You remember that? Yeah, yeah okay. The daddy will make you jump. That was, it was, that, was the, that was the tape. And I was so excited because, again, if I was going to go buy a tape, I would have had to save like two months' worth of chore money in order to go and buy this cassette tape. So here we go. Rapping, super soaker, crisscross. Seriously, the best day ever, right? Mm. Oh, it gets better. We then go to the third guy's house. This guy's name was Joe. I go into Joe's house, and Joe says, Kev, your presence inside. Come with me. So I walk into the living room, and there's some sort of structure, something underneath a blanket. And I thought, I don't know what could possibly be under this blanket, but it's got to be awesome because it's under a blanket. Yeah. <laughs> and he pulled, in my mind, it was like he pulled that blanket back in slow motion, and it was the most beautiful thing I'd seen. It was an autographed basketball by the Golden State Warriors. Oh. Now, I grew up in Oakland, California, so I was a huge Warriors fan. Does anybody remember Chris Mullen? Anybody remember Tim Hardaway? Triple Threat, these, that's who was on the basketball. And I was so convinced that every signature on that basketball was done in black pen, except for one, Chris Mullen, and it was in blue ink. And also on the basketball was a note, to Kevin, happy birthday. Love the Warriors, or I can't remember the part of the sale, but it said something like that. And it was also in blue, and so to this day, I'm convinced that Chris Mullins told me happy birthday. So seriously, the best day, the best day ever. Well, you know, I get my basketball, and Joe's uncle had worked as security, and I found out that, that he bought the basketball, gave it to the Golden State Warriors, they took it with him on a road trip, they all signed it, and it is still mine, still displayed in my bedroom. And uh, I was just so thrilled with this day. Well, we get in the car, we load up, I have all of these cool gifts, and we're on our way to go river rafting. So here we go. We get to the Stanislaus River. We jump out, we get in that raft. My dad starts to instruct us. There was a gentleman who we were renting the raft from who said, are you sure you guys are going to be okay today? You don't need anybody. You don't need a guide. You're okay. And we said to my dad, yeah, sure, we got it. The guy who's renting the raft says, now listen, for some reason this year, because it's April, this was April, that the runoff has been a little bit higher than in other years. So I just want to make sure that you guys are all set. My dad said, yeah, I worked on the river, no big deal. We had no idea what was in store for us, but we get in this boat. We've got six oars, six people. we got my mom and my dad, four 13-year-olds. Only one of us has ever been river rafting before. My father who worked on the river, and we push off. And we get out there, and my dad is teaching us some skills, right? Teaching us how to row. He's teaching us things like what he wants us to do so in case we get into trouble. And so he says, listen, when I say row right, I want you to steer the boat to the right. Now, you guys may think you're supposed to paddle on the right side of the boat. You guys know if you paddle on the right side of the boat, what side does the boat go? It's going to go to the left. And so we were trying to practice this and get the skill set together. Well, we paddled around, tootled around for a little bit. Dad must have thought that we were in good shape, so we take off. And we go down the river, and we get to this first little rapid. And it's fun. It's this little guy where we go, woo, you know, we pull the oars up. This is great. We go through this thing, and we think we're river rapping. We get to the second rapid. Same sort of thing. We get there. It's a little bit more crazy. We hold our oars up. Oh, this is great. So much fun. My dad's back there. He's steering it, and we get through the second set of rapids, and I'm going, this day has got to be the best day ever. Well, then we get close to the third set of rapids. As we're approaching the third set of rapids, we notice that there's some crazy drunk people. There was three rafts in this calm area of the river. They got out of their boats. They're walking around on the shore. Three of them have beers. They're cliff diving. And we're looking at them going, who are these idiots? But we think nothing. We go to the third rapid, and we can tell the water's going a little bit faster. I could feel my dad's panic from behind me. He's realizing, holy cow, we might actually be in a little bit of trouble. 
And the way that we knew that the river was higher than normal is normally you have trees that line the river. And normally these trees, you'd be able to see the bases of them and the roots. But instead, you can't see anything. All you see is branches, which told us that the river was significantly higher than normal. And so we are coming into this thing, and my dad sees that there's a big old tree right to the left, and we are headed right for it. And so I feel my dad's panic. The boys feel my dad's panic. My mom is prone to panic no matter what, because she's a mom. And so my dad starts saying, row right, row right. Well, we're only, we only been at this about a day, so what do you think we started to do? <laughs> Row on the right side of the boat. So we start going right towards this tree. And we're coming in at this thing, in my little 13-year-old mind, what's, what must, must have felt like 65 miles an hour, which I'm pretty sure is impossible on water in a raft, but it sure felt like it was going to be 65 miles an hour. And we're coming up to this tree, and this tree is hanging over the river. And there is not, you know, it's one of those branches that's right in front of us. It's like this thick. Not the little branches that when you're hiking and a friend does this thing and looks back and smacks you in the forehead and gives you a well. This is like a branch that will give you a concussion. And we are coming up on this thing. We did not row properly. My dad is panicked. My mom is panicked. We are heading right for this thing. The four 13-year-old boys in the front of the boat, guess what we do as soon as we see that branch coming for us? Yeah. <laughs> but there was only four people in that boat that died. Two did not. And before I knew it, we pass under this branch, and I hear thump, thump, splash. And I look back. Mom and Dad are in the water. Now, I don't know why they didn't duck. I have my suspicions. I think that it's because they were so concerned for us four boys. They were so concerned with making sure that we were okay that they forgot to take care of themselves. And as a result, bam, in the water. So here we are, four 13-year-olds, unexperienced, me hysterically crying, mostly like a little girl, and we are going through this rapid, and I don't know where my mom and dad are. I'm looking back, but the river's kind of crazy. I'm seeing they had on neon hats, because this was, this was back in, you know, like the early, this was in the 1980s, and, and so early 90s, late 80s, so neon was in. And so both of my parents had on neon hats. I can see half, and then I see half in the water, and it goes right past me, and I have no idea what's going to happen. Somehow, I do not know how, somehow, we were able to maneuver this raft through the rapids with none of us dying, and we were able to get over to some calm area of the river. And I was a boy scout, so I tied up the boat, and I sat and waited, not knowing what to do. It wasn't but minutes later that my dad makes his way to the boat, climbs in, and rests for a minute, and I see that. And he says, Kev, she's back there. And I look back, and there is this tree in the middle of this river, this forked tree. And my mom had ran right into it. The tree came up like this. The water was beating my mom at the back, and she was hitting this tree. The water, it was April in California. The water was in the 40s. And... Uh, you can imagine how that felt for a 13-year-old to see that. My dad, being the hero that he was, did whatever he could to get to mom. There was thorn bushes that were lining the side, the bank. He jumps in these thorn bushes, and he's walking over, and he's trying to get to mom. He cannot make it to her. No matter what he does, he can't get there. So my 13-year-old mind, there was only one thing that I know how to do in that, in that type of uh, environment. And I, I'm a... I'm a I'm a believer, I'm a religious guy, and I pray. And uh, I don't know what the timeline was. In my mind, it seems like as soon as I concluded that prayer, three boats of semi-drunk people <laughs> find my mom, rescue her, get her through the rapids, and back to us. Why do I tell you that story? Because it is exactly like the American lifestyle. What we do in this country is very simple. We spend a lifetime preparing for the worst case scenario. We call it preparing for retirement. We spend a lifetime making sure that we can be secure, 
making sure that our family will enjoy some form of security. So in the event of something going wrong, we know that we've got our, we've got our bases covered. Yet every now and then, we get a 2008 and a 2009. And all the plans and all the dreams and all the hopes and all the perceived security that we once thought that we had vanishes. It happened in the 30s with the Great Depression. It happened to everybody in this room with the Great Recession. 401ks were cut in half twice in a single decade. All of a sudden, all the stocks, everything that we've been investing in our entire lives before we knew it, cut in half or worse. Our homes that we've been spending years and years, the best, the best years of our life to pay off, thinking we had all this equity and value, what happened to them? Lost them. Or there wasn't much left. You know, I think you'll agree with me that everybody in this room wants to seek some form of security. And we love to go down this river of life assuming that we've prepared. See, we had a raft, we had oars, we had life vests, we had minimal training, but we had done, in our minds, everything that we thought would be necessary, so in the event of something bad happening, we'd have our bases covered. Yet we could not get ourselves out of the situation we were in. It took some crazy guys, it took these crazy ones, who were completely different than us, completely different than maybe most on the river that day, to swim up and help my mom. The people that I had judged, the people that I didn't think were worth two spits, they were the ones that saved my mom's life. So why do I share? I think you'll agree with me that this country is in a little bit of trouble. Yes or no? Yes. Yeah, we're in a little bit of trouble, aren't we? Let me give you some examples. The Social Security Administration says that what percentage of people are financially independent coming to 65? Do you know? It's le yeah, it's like less than 3% are financially independent coming to 65. <clears throat> and then we, there's other statistics. Census Bureau 2010 said that two-thirds, two-thirds of Americans come age 65 are going to be relying on Social Security for at least 50% of their income. One quarter of us at age 65, according to what the 2010 Census Bureau Act are going to be relying on Social Security for 100% of our income. Do we have a problem? You want to know what I think is just as American as apple pie? What is more American than apple pie? Commanding your own financial future. I think what the most American ideal is that we have is a concept of freedom. And freedom comes with a cost, yes, but freedom is achievable. Now, we are all very lucky to live in this country, aren't we? We have the ability to vote. We have the ability to read what we want, to say what we want. We have the ability to be free to attend events, to attend religious uh, proceedings. Whatever we want to do, we've got that freedom. That is a huge blessing. But how many of us spend an entire life thankful for the freedom we have in this country, yet never are able to achieve the kind of freedom that brings the most peace of mind? that of a financial freedom that allows us to express our purpose to its fullest. I, uh, last, you know, in December, um, I had an opportunity to uh, hang out with a guy, uh, some of you maybe have heard of, anybody heard of Les Brown? Motivational speaker, Les Brown? This guy's made $60 million over his lifetime traveling around the world, inspiring and motivating and I had a chance to spend some time with him. He, he and I, uh, uh, my business coach, a gentleman by the name of James Malachek, who's on ABC's Secret Millionaire. Anybody watch that show? ABC's Secret Millionaire. Do you remember that show? Go Hulu it. It's fantastic. It's these guys that have done well, and they go and just serve people and give them money. It's amazing. Well, James was on that show, and, and uh, James had asked Les a question. And he asked Les, here's a guy, like I said, who's motivated millions. And he asked Les, he said, Les, what is the one thing, the one book, the one audio program, or something like that that has had the most impact on your life? Anybody want to take a guess at what Les Brown said? I had never heard of it before. 
He said it was this little audio program called The Strangest Secret by Earl Nightingale. Anybody ever heard of The Strangest Secret? Okay, anybody listen to The Strangest Secret? Okay, is it awesome or is it awesome? It's incredible. And I, I wanted to quote, because I think this thing was done in the 1950s, but there is some stuff in there that I just really, really love. And I kind of, over the last seven years now, since we started this company we call Strongbrook, um, anytime I hear a suggestion from somebody that is way more successful than I am or may likely ever be, and they say you wanna read that book or you wanna to listen to that program, I've gotten to the practice of buying it immediately. We live in the era of cell phones and iPhones, and so I can buy it from Amazon, I can download it from Audible, and I can do it in an instant. And so whenever I hear of something that's powerful, I download it instantly. And so I downloaded this program, and I started to listen to it. And there was a couple things in there that I thought were so powerful, and I, I actually wrote them down because I didn't want to mess them up. And so I'm going to share them with you if you're okay with that, because this is such a good example of the American problem. Now, I don't know how accurate these statistics are, but here's what Earl Nightingale says in this program. Let's take 100 individuals who start even at the age of 25. Okay, fair so far, right? Start, take 100 individuals, do you guys remember this part from, uh, from The Strangest Secret? Let's take 100 individuals who start even at the age of 25. Do you have any idea what will happen to those men and women by the time they are 65? He goes on to say, these 100 people who all start even at the age of 25, all believe they're going to be successful. If you ask any one of them that they want to be a success, they would tell you they did. You would notice that they are eager toward life. There's a certain sparkle in their eye and a reckness to their carriage. Life seems like a pretty interesting adventure to them. But by the time they are 65, one will be rich, four will be financially independent, 41 will still be working, 54 will be broke, depending on others. He goes on and says, now think a moment. Out of the 100, only five make the grade. He goes on to explain this. He quotes a gentleman by the name of Rollo May, and I had never heard this concept before. This was so powerful to me. He says, the opposite of courage in our society is not cowardice. It is conformity. The opposite of courage in our society is not cowardice. It is conformity. He goes on to say, we learn to read by the time we are seven. We learn to make a living by the time we're 25. Often by that time, we're not only making a living, we're supporting a family. And yet by the time we are 65, we have not learned how to become financially independent in the richest land that has ever been known. Goes on and says a survey was made one time that covered a lot of people, working people. These people were asked, why do you work? Why do you get up in the morning? 19 out of 20 had no idea. Now look, this pro so guys, this program originally done the 50s. I don't know how accurate those numbers are, but did they get you thinking? We already know that less than 3% of the individuals nowadays are going to be financially independent. Do you know how many people are out of work in this country? I'm not talking about the unemployment numbers. I'm talking about how many people are out of work and have stopped looking. Does anybody know how many it is? There are 90 million people out of work in the United States of America. There are 50 million people nearly on food stamps. We have a problem. It's an American problem. It's a conformity problem. Let me demonstrate conformity. Let me put it on full display. How many of you went to high school? Raise your hand. How many of you have heard of high school? Raise your hand. For those of you who didn't raise your hand, okay, good. When you went to high school, what kind of grades were you supposed to get? Share it with me. A's. You better believe it. You're supposed to get A's, aren't you? Now, why are you supposed to get A's in high school? So you can go to college. And then when you go to college, what type of grades are you supposed to get there? A's. A's. You better believe you better get A's when you go to college because you are paying a whole lot of money to go and have somebody educate you so you can get A's so you can do what? What comes after getting A's if you go to college? What are you supposed to do next? Now you go and get a job, right? And what were you taught when you went to college? The better grades you got, the more what would happen afterwards? The more money you would make, right? Now, there may be true, there's 150 billion studies that say that it is. Look, I'm not here to dispute whether or not those studies are right or wrong. What I am here to say is that we spend an entire lifetime being taught, 
teaching our children that we must go to school to get A's, to go to school to get A's, because the more education we receive, the more money we are going to get. Plain and simple, right? It's not true for most. And then, if we go get the job because we got the college education, we go and work a job that we love or that we hate. Because MSNBC says that 86% of us hate the job that we wake up and go to every single day. Maybe like those 19 of 20 people that Earl Nightingale talked about who said they don't even know why they go to work. They do it because they're supposed to. The opposite of courage in this society is not cowardice. It is conformity. <laughs> and then there's the prison Who are the crazy ones? The entrepreneurs? The real estate investors? Those who say, I will not let somebody else dictate how much I am worth in this life, or I will dictate that, and it will only be me. Think about that for a moment. When you go and you get a job and you have an employer, does that employer tell you how much you are worth? They absolutely do because they pay you a certain amount of money. That is them telling you this is how much you are worth to me, correct? So we could, yes? It's what the job is worth. It's what the job is worth, but you took the job. So you are therefore worth that amount to that employer because if you were worth more than that to the employer, would they pay you more or would they pay you less? They would pay you more. Why do people get rank advancements? Why do people grow in any given job and begin to do better and better and better? What do they have to do? Demonstrate more value to the employer and the employer rewards them with what? More money if it's a good employer. Sometimes they just continue to take advantage of you and then you decide, I'm out of there because I'm worth more than this. How many of you have ever said, you don't have to raise your hand, just think about this. How many of you have ever been a job and you had somebody else tell you what you were worth, or you got upset, or you got frustrated at the job, and you said, I am worth more than this. I am better than this. And to the crazy ones. Now, I love the term, the crazy ones. You know who coined that term? There was an advertisement, probably decades ago now, maybe it was only 10 years ago, I don't know when it aired, but it was an advertisement that said, we are the crazy ones. And at the time, they were. They were the misfits. They were the crazy ones. They were the artists. They were different. Their name was Apple Computers. Does anybody know the story of the founding of Apple Computers? How many of you have read the book by Walter Isaacson, the biography of Steve Jobs? Anybody had a chance to read that one? Incredible. Incredible. Yeah, there you go, Steve. <laughs> it is an incredible biography because you hear a story of a man who did not want to make a product. He wanted to do what? Change the universe. How many of you get up every day and decide, today I will change the universe? If you did, you might be one of the crazy ones. These crazy ones started a company doing something completely different and completely outside of the norm that nobody else had done, and everybody looked at them like they were crazy. Do you know how Apple Computers started? Do you want to know the actual real founding of it? There was this computer group that was there uh, in, the, in the Palo Alto area, and it was called Homebrew, I think. Is that what it was, Homebrew? Homebrew is what it was called, and Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, the two original founders of Apple, they go to Homebrew, and they share their little computer that they come up with. Read that book, you will see how many things Apple has revolutionized. They were the first ones to bitmap. They were the first ones to put a keyboard with the monitor. And what you type came up on that monitor. A lot of people don't know that. They were the first ones to invent this concept of a mouse. They were always the ones that said software and hardware must be integrated. We will not simply license software. That was the main difference between them and Microsoft for a lot of years it hurt them and then ultimately it really started to help them but they demonstrate this weird thing this Apple computer and everybody in home in home group looks at them like they are nuts well I think my, my own vision of that is because they were artists they were the creative type the other guys were nerds like the husband they were engineers yeah <laughs> so the trouble is most of us don't think like engineers we think like artists, and they were artists. Absolutely, they were artists. Wozniak might have been more of an engineer, but Jobs was an artist. 
And so they go and they present and they get shut down. But there was one guy in the audience who saw the beauty of the art. And he went up to them and he said, I would like to order some of your boards. And this is where the story gets really fun. In order to build the 50 boards that they were going to sell to this gentleman, they did not have the money or the labor or the parts in order to do that. They needed capital, but they had no capital. Do you know what they did? Do you remember? Steve Jobs sold the most valuable thing he had. They knew that when they put out $50,000, or excuse me, no, they put out $5,000, they would make $50,000 if I remember right. They knew because this guy was going to buy, but they didn't have $5,000. Wozniak sold his incredible HP calculator that was his baby. It was the most, most valuable thing that he had. Steve Jobs, the thing that had the most value was his VW bus. He sold that. And then they scraped together a couple other funds. They had just enough money to go and make those boards. They sold them. They made $50,000, and Apple Computers was founded. Because of two guys with a dream in a garage who wanted to change the universe. They've revolutionized five or six industries, the crazy ones. Another crazy one. I, I am so fortunate to be featured in a book that's coming out in April next to a woman by the name of Barbara Corcoran. Has anybody heard of Barbara Corcoran from Shark Tank? Do you know how she started? A $1,000 loan from her boyfriend in order to leave the 22 jobs that she'd been working, that she hated somebody else telling her what she was worth and what she could do. And she said, I've got to go out and I have to do something different. She had no money. She borrowed a thousand dollars and she started a real estate firm. She didn't even, she wasn't even a licensed agent until a year after she had started the firm. And then she grew that to the largest real estate firm in New York. Would you like to know how she did it? She wanted some customers. She wanted some notoriety. She went to her computer. It was actually not a computer. It was a typewriter at the time. And she put some numbers together in a report, and she sent it to every single person that was a writer at the New York Times, whether that was sports, whether that was whatever. She sent it to them. And before she knew it, she was on the front page of the New York Times, and she kept sending them more stuff. And now the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times were quoting Barbara Corcoran, the Corcoran Group, as these are the numbers. Here's what's happening in the economy. All she was doing is putting numbers on a paper, they never verified them, they simply published them. And then that was true. And then everybody started to look at her as the expert of what did she did. Business. She was asked one time, why don't more people think that way? Or why haven't, why, no, she was asked, why haven't more people done something like that? She said, because they don't think like that. So how are we the artistic ones? How do we need to think different? There are two ways. Become a business owner and own real estate. Robert Kiyosaki in a book called Cash Flow Quadrant. Anybody ever read Cash Flow Quadrant? Great book. There's four quadrants. He says you don't want to live in the self-employed or the employee quadrant. What are the two quadrants you want to live in? The business owner and the investor. And he says it's interesting. There's a couple ways to become a business owner. Do you remember what he says? Anybody read that book? It was kind of crazy to me. He says buy a franchise. You could start a business from scratch, but then you'll be in the self-employed column for a while and hopefully you'll grow it enough to where you can get over to the business owner side and you've got employees and you've got a system. By the way, you guys know what system stands for, right? Do you know what it stands for? System. Save yourself time and money, okay? <laughs> just, just think about that. That's why systems are good. Systems increase predictability. They save you time and money. So, uh, where was I? What was I talking about? Help me out. Oh, gotcha. Investor and business owner. He said you could buy a franchise or you could do something completely insane, completely artistic, completely ridiculous. And listen, I'm going to tell you right now, what I'm about to share with you is just what he said. I don't know if I agree with it, but I know that there is some serious merit to it. Do you remember what the other thing was he said you could do? Boy, in this valley, it's a rough one. Join an MLM or a direct sales company because you have a system. You have a brand. You have something. Crazy, right? Be crazy. Why real estate? Because it's tangible. How do you invest in real estate? You've got to have a system and you've got to have somebody that does the majority of the hard work for you because doggone it, it's too much for most people to do on their own. <clears throat> Guys, how many of us are in the raft going down the river, terrified at what's coming, and we get smacked out of the boat, thought we were prepared and now we are not? And the environment is beating us to death. And we have no idea how to escape. 
just maybe, there's some crazy ones that have come along in your life. You may have been introduced to some tonight, I don't know. But there might be some crazy ones that have blazed a trail and blazed a path so that you don't have to start from scratch. I encourage you to seek it out. Whatever it is for you, do not be like 97% of Americans. Be different, think different, be an artist, be a crazy one. Simply command your own financial future, command your own freedom. What is more American than that? I promise you, if you will seek it, it will appear. I know that. I encourage you to do it. Thank you, everybody.